Joe Kissel takes control of Monterey. This is Mac Voices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Text Expander by Smile, the makers of world-class software. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more and download your free demo. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, once again, we are looking down the barrel at the release of Apple's latest operating systems for a lot of their devices, if not all of their devices. This time, to help us make sure we get our desktop done right, we have Joe Kissel back to talk about his latest Take Control be- Take Control book, um, Take Control of Monterey. Joe, welcome back. It's good to have you. Nice to be here. You know... I'm 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 still in the red room and I'm wearing my Heisenberg t-shirt because life is full of uncertainty. Uh, <laughs> Please, is that a metaphor for I uh, um Monterey? Well, I you know, I I didn't really intend it that way, but now that you mention it kind of yes. Um and and I think I think uh I think that will come out in the next uh the next uh short period of time. I have, I have many things to say that, that, uh, that do involve uncertainty. So yeah, sure. Okay. So why don't we take this sort of from the ground up? Because for a long time, you and I talked about take control titles that were related to take control of upgrading too. Yeah. And I don't think we're doing that this time because this time, right. This time we're just going straight. So the obvious question is, well, I guess the first question is, should we upgrade to Monterey when it comes out? Yeah. So just, just to go back, you know, last year was the first year that we did not do the upgrading to title, which I had done since, you know, 2003. And um, I don't need to be, let's sort of belabor the whole story behind that. But anyway, we decided that instead of having like take control of upgrading to the new operating system, then have a separate book on using the new operating system, we're just gonna have one. And then so I I took all of my upgrading instructions and I slimmed them down and like compressed and condensed and just popped those right into the Monterey book. So we still, the book still has upgrading instructions, uh, complete instructions, you get everything you need to know to, to get the job done, uh, but it's just one book. So we're doing the same thing this year as we did last year in that sense. Uh, so should you upgrade? Now, this is interesting. Last year when we talked about Big Sur, uh, I mean, Big Sur changed a lot of stuff. It looks a lot different, has new features, but the, the biggest thing of all about Big Sur was, oh, support for Apple Silicon. So you got an M1, whatever kind of Mac. Uh, it is going to be running Big Sur or later because that was the first one uh, to, to support that, um, that kind of chip. So... Uh, this this time around, the changes are not nearly so dramatic. Of course, yes, that still supports both Intel and Apple Silicon, uh, or silicon, as uh, as some people uh, put it. I have, you know, I'm going to use my own idiolect because why not? Uh, but uh, it looks very much like Big Sur, and it has new features. We'll talk about, but. Uh, it's not it's not as jarring as of a transition, but it's also probably not as necessary of a transition. Um, you know, I always install all the betas, and so I'm I'm the one you know uh, experiencing that pain. So the rest of you don't have to, because betas can be buggy, and the betas of Monterey so far have been buggy, and they've been missing features, and they have been frustrating in a lot of ways. And you can't make judgments about what the final version of software will look like based on the betas, because stuff can and does change. That's that's the point, uh, to to find and fix bugs. Things have changed during the betas a lot, not just in in Monterey either, in in iOS 15, iPadOS 15, and so forth too. But but these betas have been kind of rough for me. Not rough in the sense of like my Mac is crashing or I'm losing data or that kind of stuff, but just things not working at all. And uh, I it, some some big important things just not working at all. And so it hasn't it hasn't sucked in the sense of like it hasn't prevented me from getting my work done. I can get my work done. It's fine. But 
I have not actually been able to use some of the most important, biggest, flashiest new features, or I've only been able to kind of sort of use them a little bit. And so sprinkled all throughout the book are like, well, as of publication time, this wasn't really working in the betas. We'll see what happens. You know, every year we do this, we, we release a book based on the beta versions and then when the operating systems are released for real, well, we update the book to version 1.1 and it's a free update and that covers everything that has changed since uh, the beta versions and and we, you know, fix what needs to be fixed. So that'll happen again this time. But I just want to say, like, if the question confronting you is, should I install the beta version of Monterey or should I wait for the full release? I would... I would kind of tend towards saying don't don't install the beta. Don't yeah just yeah just just wait. <laughs> it's it's not going to blow up your Mac. I like it's not it's not terrible, but it's also not great. And so maybe that will change tomorrow. Maybe there'll be a new beta and all the things that I am unhappy about will magically be resolved. But uh to answer your question, I would say uh when the time comes when uh, Monterey 1.0 or you know 12.0 is released. That would probably be an okay upgrade, but uh, I wouldn't rush it. Okay, that's fair. And when we talked to Josh about his uh, book about the the iOS and iPadOS, one of the part, parts of the discussion we had was the whole beta process and is it good? Is it not? Is it is it detrimental to Apple or is it advantageous to Apple? And I, I get the impression that you're on the side of, you know, maybe the, whether it's good for Apple or not, it's not necessarily good for you if you're installing it on a production machine, which if well, you are, God help you. Yeah, I mean, that then, you know, if if you're doing that, then that's that's your problem. Like, you know, I th this is my job, right? This is what I have to do. I'm writing a, I'm writing books, editing books about the new operating systems. I can't not have them on... Uh, on my computers, my you know iPad and iPhone and so forth. But uh, for for people not in the industry, people who aren't developers or authors or, or whatever, um, yeah, you, 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 if you have a spare device, that, you know, that's the one you install it on. But you don't you don't put it on your main machine because stuff is going to go wrong, and you're going to be without without tools or capabilities that you need for an unknown amount of time. So when we upgraded to Big Sur, it felt like there were a lot of changes. Things looked a lot different. There was just, you know, the, it was a significant change. Yeah. Can we expect to see the same thing with Monterey or is it a little more subtle and under the hood? No, it's 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 subtle. It's very subtle. Uh, if you... If you didn't know, you're just like, oh, I, I'm I'm standing in front of a Mac. Uh, wonder which version is it? Is it Monterey or Big Sur? I mean, you'd have to poke around a little bit, look at some things. It wouldn't be obvious on at first glance. Uh, there are there are definitely some things that are different, but they're not they're not in your face. You know, they're more as you say, they're more subtle. So if if you if you have gotten used to the look and feel and features of Big Sur, you will feel absolutely right at home. Of course, if you are upgrading from some older version of Mac OS, it will feel pretty different. Okay, that's that's good. I, not that there was anything bad with Big Sur, but it's just it it can be a little jarring, especially if you are you know in a production environment to say, okay, I'm about to upgrade, and now all of a sudden everything looks radically different. So let's say I do upgrade on on day one. Um, what are some of the first things I should know about iOS or iOS Monterey, Mac OS Monterey? Sorry, geez. Um, to to make sure that I don't have any issues or that I'm starting right away to take advantage of some of the best features. Yeah, well, as has been the case for a long time, uh, Apple has, is is just you know tightening the screws on security, and of course the 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 positive way of looking at that is Apple's trying to keep the bad guys out. You know, there's there's malware, there's hackers, there's all all the all the bad things, and so uh, so that's that's the positive aspect of it. The negative aspect is that it makes life more inconvenient for you. 
So one of the things that's happening in Monterey is that some uh, system extensions that you may have had installed, if the developer has not upgraded them over the last year or so, it used to be that it's just like, well, there is a message that pops up on the screen saying, this is kind of deprecated and you might need to go click a button and restart your Mac in order to use this. It'll work, but you have to jump through some extra hoops. And now there are cases in which the message is a little different. Like, it's just not gonna work at all. And uh, go ahead and click whatever buttons you want and restart as many times, it's not gonna work. So you really, really, really have to pester the developer for uh, an update to this. There aren't a ton of those, but there are a few. And so there, there is definitely some software that either doesn't work anymore at all in Monterey, or it you know, needs an update, or the developer has to go down a different path. I mean, this is something maybe later on we'll talk about uh, Apple Mail. It, it's We're not there yet, but Apple is certainly setting the ground, lay, laying the groundwork so that in the future, the, the kinds of plugins that Mail has been using in the past will stop working and they'll have to use a new sort, which are, are better in some ways, more secure, but also don't have as many capabilities. So. There, as you know, mail is just an example, but all throughout Monterey, there are places where, uh, for for you know, good legitimate reasons, Apple is making some things not work unless developers jump through different hoops, and even having jumped through those hoops, the new thing might not work as well as the old thing did, or might not be able to do all the same stuff. So. It's this is nothing new, right? Every every time you upgrade Mac OS, you gotta go through all your software, make sure everything's up to date. And anything that you really, really depend on, your the 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 main tools that you rely on every day to get your stuff done, double check before you install Monterey to make sure that the developer has updated them, that they are going to keep working, that they're going to have the features you need. And if not, then you might have to make a decision. Well, do I delay upgrading to Monterey or do I live without this app or do I switch it out for some uh, competing app that does something kind of similar? Uh, this is, you know, nothing, nothing new about this, but just a reminder, like some stuff is going to break. So be careful. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Smile the makers of Text Expander. There's no one who uses a Mac, iPhone, or iPad that doesn't repeatedly enter text of one kind or another. Not only is it boring, but it also wastes time and is prone to mistakes. Text Expander from Smile solves that problem so that you aren't bored, are more productive, and are always accurate. Just a few keystrokes can expand to those things that we all type over and over and over. Our email address, our mailing address, our phone numbers, or something more elaborate a designated response to a customer inquiry, directions to home or office, or a standard clause in a business contract. Even better, you can share your snippets, that's text expander speak for those short abbreviations you create that expand into characters, words, or paragraphs, across devices and across platforms, since there are versions of text expander for virtually any platform you use. Up your productivity game with my most frequently used utility, text expander from Smile the makers of world-class software at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. That's smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Thanks to Smile for being the longest-running sponsor of Mac Voices. The, the convenience thing, I mean, we, we've said it a million times, you know, that that's just, if you want to be secure, that's what it's going to be. It's like walking your front door. It would be nice to just walk up to your front door and walk in, but, you know, you have to... Unless you want everybody to be able to walk in, you have to use the key. So yep. it, and and I have to say that after I got used to the Big Sur thing, annoy and yes, yeah, sometimes not annoying as some other security procedures on certain other platforms I could name um, that I occasionally have to interact with. So that was sort of the good news, but you know it, the fact that it's there. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, I I can feel pretty good about the fact that when I am annoyed, I also know that I'm. I'm annoyed because I am being a little bit safer. Yeah. Yeah. 
where do we go from there? I mean, are there are there tent pole features that you felt were really great and recognizing that at least some of them are not functioning maybe fully? Well, you know, so back in back in June, I'm watching the WWDC keynote as one does, and they're talking about Monterey and all the new features, and, and not just Monterey, all the all the fall operating systems. And a lot of these things, I'm just rolling my eyes like, okay, whatever. <sighs> you know, there, there are some things that I just really, really don't care about. But there was one thing that made me go, oh, yes, yes, I need that. I, I can use that. This, this affects me personally. And uh, that feature was share play. Share play was the thing that made me go, oh boy, now we're talking because uh, as, as I'm sure you and Josh discussed and it will, has come up or, and or will come up in other contexts, SharePlay is this, this thing across Apple platforms that Apple made such a big deal about at WWC. And uh, the idea is, oh, well, I can start a FaceTime call with my friend or friends anywhere in the world. And while I'm on this FaceTime call on my phone or my iPad or whatever, let's watch a video together, let's watch a TV show or a movie or listen to some music or whatever, do some kind of uh, thing and keeps it in sync. So we got the call going over here and then we have the video going up there. It could be on your Apple TV or your iMac or whatever. And and it stays in sync for everybody. And any any of the, any of the parties could say, I wanna pause this and then it pauses for everybody or rewind fast forward. And if somebody talks, then it automatically lowers the volume so that you can hear each other talking. And this is great because, you know, during pandemic times, my um, my my socializing went way down. I wasn't wasn't I wasn't doing a lot of it previously, but it went to even lower levels. And uh, in particular, uh, you know, Morgan and I have have a friend who would come over every Saturday night, and we would have drinks and we would watch. TV shows or movies together. This was this is our regular, you know, weekly our, like our one our one dependable socializing thing. And uh, and then uh, you know when the, the pandemic hit, we we stopped doing that. And uh, and there are other people that we would love to watch movies and TV shows with very inconveniently in other cities and countries. So I'm like, well, this is great because we could do the same thing. Uh, you know, our our friend could could watch whatever we're going to watch on her TV and we could watch it on ours and we make ourselves drinks, but we're, but we're still having our live interaction on, on FaceTime. And I thought, well, this is, this is, this is really useful for me. This is great. And it wasn't in the first bit or the second or the third or, and then at, at some point Apple just said, yeah, it's actually not going to be in 12.0 and 15.0. This will be coming in a release later this fall. One thing I was really excited about, and and so I haven't, I haven't used it. Like I, it hasn't been in the betas, so I I haven't tried that. It sounds great. It sounds like it will solve an actual problem for me. And uh, although I, I I love just sitting in my living room watching Ted Lasso with my wife, uh, even better with more people, you know. So um, so that that was a bummer. There are other things that Apple has not yet come out and said, not going to be there in the first release, but yet they haven't shown up in the betas. And one of those is universal control. So the idea is, well, I've got my iMac here. I've got my uh, MacBook. I've got my iPad. Uh, maybe I can just use one keyboard and one trackpad for all of those things. And I can drag a window from my Mac onto my iPad screen and I can drag something from my iPad onto my MacBook and and just using one trackpad and one keyboard and all these things sort of work together. I'm like that would be really cool. Like I've got I've got uh three Macs right right here in front of me and an iPad and uh and an iPhone and like that would be really helpful to me. Um uh, as hasn't shown up yet. That was that was going to be one of those big things. So those two things are, I, I think, what make me the saddest. Just like 
I'm sure they'll be great when they exist. And 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 they were they were supposed to be among those tentpole features, but they aren't there yet. So, mm. um, so uh, that that has to be said. Um, but I want to talk about another thing, which is focus. So another one of those big features, as as I was writing about it, it. It kind of enraged me. So, okay. So every, everybody, everybody knows, you know, do not disturb. Like all your apps can send notifications for any of a million reasons and you get messages and phone calls and stuff. Uh, you need to not be disturbed. So you, you click a button and, and, you know, all that stuff gets turned off and maybe it's just turned off for like manually for however long you need it, or maybe it's turned off overnight and you have it on a schedule, but that's, that's do not disturb. That's been around for a while and that's, that's useful. So focus is supposed to be like that, but even more so. So uh, with focus, you don't just have a single do not disturb mode. You have a bunch of different modes. So uh, you have a mode for when you're doing work, mode for when you're reading, mode for when you're playing, mode for when you're, uh, whatever, doing email, like any any sort of situation or task, you can say, well, when I'm in this mode, I only want to be disturbed by these people or these apps, or I won't only want to receive these kinds of notifications. So it's like do not disturb, only instead of like one big on off switch, you have a bunch of different, you know, a dial, you can set it to different things like uh, for, for this context, for this type of situation, I, I want these people and apps to be able to sort of override my my do not disturb setting and um and in these other situations no 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 i really really need to concentrate and i don't want to be disturbed at all so i'm looking at this and i'm thinking okay well i mean i don't really think i'll ever ever use that at all but i i appreciate the the intention of letting us focus on different things for different reasons but but you know, I have like a I, I, hundred different apps that have all asked me for permission to send me notifications. Plus, you know, everybody in messages, plus websites I go to, hey, can we notify you about things? And and as, as I started reviewing all the different people and apps and system processes and websites that have been constantly demanding to be able to notify me of things, I realized this is a really terrible dysfunctional situation that Apple has created. So focus is a way of lessening, uh, you know, it's Apple's way to allow you to lessen a problem they created. They're like, we want for every app in the world to be able to notify you of anything at any time. And so I constantly have these things bing, 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 bing going off on, on the corner of my screen and on my, you know, watch and iPad and all, all the things. And uh, boy, they're annoying. They're Not only are they annoying, but after a while, they just all sort of merge together. And I don't I, like, I just, whatever it is, just, just dismiss, 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 because I can't be bothered. And so the notifications are doing the opposite of what they're supposed to do. And so what I want is not to have to go to more effort to try to figure out which of my hundred apps I should allow in at a certain time. What I the problem that I wish that we could solve is why why do so many apps need to ask for my attention all the time anyway? Like can't I just do my thing without all the constant interruptions? And so I that so that's that's what sort of really. I mean, rage is a bit strong, but it really irritated me writing about this is just noticing how bad this situation has gotten. No website ever, ever needs to be able to notify me about anything. Like if I get a phone call, okay, I got a phone call. If I get a message, I get a message. And that's, I guess that's nice for me to be able to determine who can, which, which people or phone numbers or email addresses, whatever, are going to pop something up on my screen. But I mean, I kind of always want to focus whatever I'm doing on my Mac or my other devices, whatever I'm doing, wherever I am, whatever mode I'm in, I always want to focus. I never want to have, you know, five interruptions with alerts every minute and I don't need them. So, all right, I'm done ranting.
<laughs> I, you know, I, I, I looked at Focus and I thought, okay, I'm kind of anxious to see how this is implemented because there, there, are, there are at least a dozen utilities sort of like this along the yeah. the way out there that will do various things. You know, it might black out part of your screen or it might shut your internet off or whatever for a period of time so that you can focus. Um, I, I'm not sure I completely agree with you because I do think that there's something to be said for allowing the apps that are important to me to notify me of things. Like if, if my team at work uses Slack, yeah, I probably need to be notified when somebody posts something to Slack, but I also need to be able to turn that off when I really... In in a physical world, you would go into the conference room, shut the door, and be able to work without anybody bothering you. So I'm I'm kind of back and forth on this, um, but I do like the idea of of the, being able to dial in my degree of of focus or my degree of privacy or non notification. Um, and so, given that given that, I mean, have you found that focus works as advertised at this I, point? I mean, no, <laughs> no, okay, <laughs> no. <laughs> No, uh, you know, in, in my testing, it's been, it's been kind of flaky. Like I'd, I'd have a focus set up to like, okay, if I'm reading a book in books, which I use books, but only very rarely on my Mac, it's usually on my iPad or my iPhone. Uh, like, okay, when I'm reading something in books, then, uh, only allow these other apps to interrupt me, but then th they didn't. So I, I don't know. It just, it, it wasn't, it wasn't switching modes for me the way it was advertised and i'm like okay whatever it's a beta i don't i don't expect perfection i expect there to be some bugs but it kind of wasn't 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 even working as advertised for me uh but i realized that you know just what i want out of my mac is not for every single app i install and every website i go to to force me to opt out i would like to just say don't ever, don't ever ask me to opt out. Just, just let me manually opt in when I want to opt into something. And uh, okay, and arguably Focus does exactly that. Yes, you have to you know, say, well, when I'm doing this, when this app is open, I want this person to be able to notify me or whatever it is. It, it is opting in, but you can only get to that point after you've already installed the app and it says, can I notify you of anything anytime? And you say, no. So just don't do that. Just stop doing that. That's what I would like. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. And I, the website thing, I do absolutely find annoying. Um, you know, I, I can't think – I don't think there's a single website that I say, yes, send me notifications. Um, yeah. I, I, could, I, could, I could mention a, a website that, that you, you would be very familiar with that, um, that implemented that feature and I – sort of lost it and um the feature ended up going away i think without without joy but um I, my 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 opinion was nevertheless uh taken into account um but yeah i ooh, those are the worst website notifications are the worst Joe Kissel will be back in the next edition of Mac Voices to talk more about his new book, Take Control of Monterey, and the new features that are coming or the revised features that are coming in uh, the new version of the Mac OS that includes the new version of Safari, uh, automation and shortcuts, and a whole lot more. That's next time on Mac Voices, and I hope you'll join us. Until then, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.